Hello, everybody. Welcome to Demystifying Bisexuality, Exploring New Research. My name is Justin Bengry. I'm director of the Center for Queer History at Goldsmiths University of London, where I also convene the MA Queer History, the first postdoctoral program of its kind in the world. I'm really happy to be hosting this event um, for a whole variety of reasons. This is our first event run by the center this year after the disruptions of COVID. Um, so I'm delighted that we can come back with, uh, with events around LGBTQ history. I'm also happy that we're using this event to draw attention to research in bisexuality, something that's notably absent in a lot of historical research. So I'm really happy that this could be something that might spur further discussion and draw further interest to histories of bisexuality. I'm also delighted that this event is hosted or chaired by one of our MA Queer History students, Dr. Julia Shaw. So it's uh, delightful to, uh, to have so many exciting people involved in the program. This is a collaboration between the Center, uh, the Center for Queer History and the Staff LGBTQ Network at Goldsmiths as a fundraiser for an opportunity to draw attention to the Metro charity. Um, as part of our collaboration with the staff network, um, I also just want to, uh, uh, to, to, to make a small statement on behalf of the staff network. Um, every year, uh, the Goldsmiths Staff LGBTQ Network sponsors a different charity in response to the Tavistock v. Bell case and the minimal number of LGBTQ staff working in gender identity development services. This year, we are excited to work with Metro as a charity that provides LGBTQ young people with access to LGBTQ identified therapists, counselors, and youth workers. Tonight is the inaugural event of this partnership, and we look forward to many, many more. So watch this space. Um, if you want to be live tweeting the event as we go through uh, today's proceedings, please feel free to tag the Center for Queer History at Queer Hist Gold. You can also use the hashtag LGBTHM21 to recognize this year's LGBT plus History Month. And with that, I'd like to turn proceedings over to Mark Delacour, the Director of External Affairs at the Metro Charity. Thank you. There we go. My, the first non-unmute of the evening. Um, thank you, Justin. It's really an exciting panel. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and as you say, this is the first fruit of our collaboration with the Goldsmiths LGBTQ staff network. So we're really excited to be having this first event and look forward to many more. Uh, Metro is a charity that's done a lot of work with LGBTQ plus communities since 1983. Um, and it's something that's still very much at the core of the work that we do in terms of the number of LGBTQ plus specific services that we offer. And if you're interested in finding out more about those services, then you can visit our website, metrocharity.org.uk, and have a little look in our service directory. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Julia Shaw, um, who will be chairing this evening. Hi. It's absolutely wonderful to welcome all of you to this event. It's my pleasure to host one of the few events on bi specific to bisexuality for LGBT History Month. Um, it's really nice to have a space to specifically talk about issues related to bisexuality. Um, also, as a bonus, everyone on today's panel is themselves bi, so there's a lot of bi representation and uh, talk about the community for the community, but also, uh, of course, for allies and other people who are interested in poly, pan, plurisexual, queer, unlabeled, fluid, basically anyone who doesn't consider themselves sort of fitting into a neat binary. Um, that's who also we focus on in terms of the bi research group, which is um, a research group that I started last year in search of other scholars who are interested in research on bisexuality to try and also there build a community between researchers who are looking at this specific in-between space, if you will, um, and giving it its own research its own air. So I am delighted to have today with us uh, a fast paced group of people in the sense that the panel discussion will be fast paced because we have quite a lot of people. Um, but I really wanted to give you a snapshot of some of the incredible research that's happening in our field. My background is in criminal psychology. So I am a research associate at University College London. Um, so yes, I am a doctor, but I'm also doing a master's. So I've gone back and done a second master's and I'm doing it at queer in queer history at Goldsmiths. And uh, it's an absolutely delightful program. Would also, side note, recommend the program to others who are interested in doing research on queer history. 
Um, my background I didn't realize would be as relevant as it is, but of course doing research on criminal psychology and criminology gives you quite a lot of background in deviance and um, as we know, a non-heteronormative uh, sexualities, including bisexuality, often fall within this framework of how we understand deviance more generally. Um, more depressingly, uh, I also realized in the history context that a lot of our history is written in the sort of records of courtrooms, and that's because of a long history of criminalization of LGBT issues and LGBT experiences and behaviors. Um, we uh, That's often where records are in terms of finding and tethering yourself, if you will, to your own history. And that's not just true for bisexual people, but for lots of queer people in general. So that's my background, um, but I'm going to hand this over quickly. I'm going to sort of be moderating this panel and I will be um, linking up with each of the different researchers and individuals we have as part of our panel today. Uh, so we have, uh, I'm just gonna very briefly say who we have. We've got Jacob Engelberg, who is a doctoral candidate in film studies at King's College London, who's currently in the last year of his PhD. We have Effie Theos, who is an East London-based producer and director. Um, and we'll talk about storytelling and by visibility. We've got Dr. Ellen bells catton who's a critical social psychologist at the Open University, who does research on bisexual spaces. And we've got Sam Lawton, who's a social researcher who studies sexuality and the stigma of bi plus men. We're gonna go in that order. And so I am pleased to first talk to Jacob Engelberg. So Jacob, you are a doctoral candidate in film studies at King's College London at the moment, and you're researching bisexual representation in cinema from the 1970s to the 1990s. You've also written about bisexual erotics, Tumblr's counter-hegemonic pornographics, por pornography, sorry, uh, bisexuality, non-monogamy, and the visualization of desire in cinema. You're also, I'm proud to say, part of the bisexual research group. So, Jacob. Bisexuality as a discursive category. Can you tell me more? <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction, Julia. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so yeah, my, my PhD uh, looks at specifically at bisexual transgression in film uh, between the 1970s and the 1990s. Um, and my background is both in film studies and in queer studies. And I wanted to start off by talking about bisexuality as having a history and discourse, um, because I think that that's kind of the natural starting point for me. Um, so for people who are unfamiliar, queer studies emerged right at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, uh, as a kind of intervention in, t in the kind of conversations that people were having around gender and sexuality uh, in the academy. Um, and it was an intervention into uh, a tendency to treat gender, sexuality, sex, as if these had been uh, stable categories that had remained the same throughout history. Uh, the, the key thing with queer studies um, was um, to do with their methodology, which was post-structuralist, meaning that rather than see these things as staying the same throughout history, um, they treated them as historically contingent, i.e. what sexuality means, what gender means, what sex means, changes throughout history dependent on uh, discourse, culture, uh, society, social relations, politics, uh, so those things. So when we approach bisexuality in that way, um, that's a way of saying that bisexuality isn't this one thing that has existed in the same way throughout history. Yes, there have always been uh, people that have expressed desires towards people of more than one gender, uh, but the important thing is to is to attend to the specifics um, of how that sexuality made itself knowable. So with bisexuality, uh, like, like the other uh, common sexuality categories, its roots are in medicine predominantly. It actually comes from botany, um, the, the first usage of the term. Uh, but later, uh, it comes into psychoanalysis, sexology, um, and it's around the 1930s, 1940s um, that it gets thought, that it begins being talked about in the way that we would understand it now. 
um, as attraction towards people of more than one gender. Um, and those started with quite binary uh, definitions, but already by the late 60s and 70s, there are people who are calling themselves bisexual um, and defining that word on their own terms, not in a binaristic sense always. Um, and from the 70s onwards, we see the emergence of bisexual politics, um, bisexual communities specifically, um, and it's a history that people don't always know a great deal about. Um, so the final thing that I'll, I'll just say in terms of that history is, as someone who's kind of uh, trained in queer studies, one of the um, lovely things that I discovered in my MA was there was a whole kind of subfield of queer studies called bisexual theory. Um, and bisexual theory operated in this way. Um, it interrogated um, the kind of histories of sexuality and gender um, and the norms um, that, that have been set up historically around those categories. But its key intervention was to challenge uh, queer studies on its assumption of a gay position, um, what it saw as this kind of oppositional uh, position against uh, heterosexuality um, and to ask the question um, to what extent is is the uh, social norm that you must be attracted towards only one gender uh, a significant uh, thing socially. Uh, so that kind of undergirds my work um, as I start to think about the representability of sexuality on film. Fascinating. So I think that I th this, that's a great, I think, opening in terms of talking about definitions as well and sort of where these concepts of sexuality come from and what counts as bisexual. Because I think a lot of people, I mean, I get asked this all the time, of, yeah, but isn't bi, for example, trans exclusionary or isn't bi, are, isn't, doesn't it mean that you're, you know, supporting a gender binary, basically. And that's actually... Uh, some of you are probably probably knows. I'm sure everyone in this room knows that. Uh, but bi refers actually and always has to both as in bi, but both are being heterosexual and homosexual. And of course, that just refers to attraction to same and other. And so bi doesn't mean binary in, in terms of gender. It means bi in terms of both of those categories. Um, and so that's why usually also today, and I did some research on the research group as to what researchers say today and, and how they define bisexuality. And it's only recently changed actually in the def in dictionary as well. Um, Robin Ox did some great work pushing for a more inclusive um, and more representative, frankly, view of uh, the definition of bisexuality, which usually is defined as attraction either beyond gender or attraction to people of multiple genders rather than attraction to men and women. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like it's a good time to clarify that right off the bat. Um, and yeah, that is inclusive of people who might identify or use other labels like pan or poly or plurry or whatever. I mean, people have whatever fits them, of course, is the right term for them. But I also think we need to be careful with label gatekeeping, it's called, sort of who's allowed to call themselves by and who's not allowed to call themselves by. Um, and just make sure that it's an inclusive space where people can feel like they can fit and they can use that label. Um, and it's not uh, trans exclusionary. Um, so in terms of bisexuality's represent re representability in media, so your work focuses a lot on how we can show that someone is bi in film. So can you tell me about that? Yeah, because it's a, it's a very interesting issue. I think um, you'll often hear activists talking about uh, a dearth of bisexual representation um, in media. Uh, or bad representation in media, which we will maybe get onto. Um, but I think the place that we really need to start is how does a sexuality become readable on film or um, I'll say film because that's my, that's my area, but this could apply to other screen media. How does it become representable in the first place, any kind of sexuality? And I think when it comes to bisexuality, there's a lot of hurdles um, that we the, that we can encounter with how to account for bisexual desire on film, because does it involve needing to show a character engaged with multiple people of different genders throughout the film? How do we know that 
even if that happens, one relationship might be treated as less authentic than another relationship. There are lots of these barriers um, that we come up against because ultimately the way that we are, um, that people regularly read sexuality on film is through a monosexual binary. And for people unfamiliar with that term, monosexuality means attraction towards only one gender, so heterosexuality or homosexuality. When it comes to bisexuality, there's there's a host of problems. Um, and so in terms of like the ordering of relationships, um, as I said, these kind of narratives can be uh, can be written as coming out narratives where the earlier relationship is treated as the closeted one, the later relationship is treated as the authentic one, um, or as perhaps experimentation narratives where um, where one has an experimental youth and then matures into monosexuality. So. In, in this kind of uh, arena of signification, let's call it, uh, it becomes very difficult to discern something that's specifically bisexual. But I don't necessarily think that that is a problem per se. I think one of the things that we can learn from this is how the claim that media can definitively represent any sexuality is a flawed claim. Um, and I think that bisexuality's difficulty in being represented on screen actually tells us something much broader uh, about the inability of film to ever be able to provide a singular meaning uh, in that sense or a defin one definitive uh, portrait of what sexuality, what asexuality looks like. And I think that's actually quite useful for us when we approach media. Yeah, I think that's a uh, decentering. also the heteronormative assumptions, I think is also sort of what you're touching on there. And what that means is sort of right now in um, a lot of films, but also in the world, frankly, in most areas, uh, we assume that people are heterosexual unless proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. And certainly for me, it's fun to also what's referred to as queer. So we just you can queer things by just having a queer busier queer glasses on and saying, I'm going to look at this through a different perspective. And I just queer everything now. I just assume everyone's bi or fluid until proven otherwise, because that's in some ways the most inclusive starting point um, is that, well, I don't know who you're attracted to until I see some sort of expression of that in some way. But what that expression then is and what I then read things as um, is still an interesting question that, Jacob, you're, you're looking at a lot. So has that changed over time, the representation or attempt to represent bisexuality in film over time? Yeah, I mean, I don't know to what extent we can, we can call things attempts even because that maybe suggests some intentionality there, which I don't think we necessarily that we necessarily need. Um, I think there's, there's two things going on. There's the signification of sexuality and there's the interpretation of sexuality. So I think that thing that you were just talking about of the kind of queer reading practices, early queer film studies or the first kinds of um, queer film studies really looks a lot at classical Hollywood, which isn't known for its explicit gay representation at all. Um, but it was about finding these kind of, uh, these meaningful moments in a glance between two people or the way someone's dressed in figures like Marlena Dietrich or Marlon Brando or people like that. Um, so there's a lot to be said about the way that we interpret things. And one of the nice things about bisexual theory um, is that there are quite a few uh, scholars of bisexual theory that have written about bisexual reading modes. Um, and one of those reading modes is, um, is uh, described by someone called Fran Michelle, who talks about not treating um, a narrative, uh, a narrative as, I think she uses the word teleological, which is me, meaning that you put all the emphasis on the end and uh, you're acting as if there's a kind of aim uh, to a narrative, but instead um, you treat all the kind of uh, moments 
that happen on equal footing. And so that is a kind of uh, interpretive framework we can maybe use um, that makes uh, bisexuality more uh, legible. Um, but in terms of the kind of signification thing, I think we still come across these, these problems of the difficulty of representing the simultaneity of bisexual um, desire. And one of the very interesting things actually, when we look at the history of film um, in the past 20, 30 years, uh, looking at porn um, has been kind of folded in as a, as a subfield of, of film studies. And one of the interesting things around bisexuality and porn is that in the 1980s, bisexual porn emerges as a subgenre, um, which the kind of thing that it needed to, um, the kind of definition, the definitional, tra definitional trait of bisexual porn was showing a man simultaneously having sex with a man and a woman in a threesome or a more or a kind of group scene. Um, and it's fascinating to me, A, the kind of obvious thing that female bisexuality or the performance of female bisexuality was so commonplace in straight porn that it needn't be categorized as bisexual bisexuality. So that's the first interesting thing. The second interesting thing um, is that um, we get this, uh, the emergence of this porn category um, with the kind with the kind of porn that provides us with a simultaneous representation of desire towards people of two different genders. Um, and I think that that tells us something about bisexuality's legibility, that this is one of the only images where bisexuality can be definitively read. Um, so I don't necessarily have like an answer um, for how we like, um, how we represent bisexuality in an affirmative and um, and readable way, but instead, I think looking at bisexuality can tell us a lot about uh, about the structures of signification around sexuality um, and screen media. Great, uh, fascinating. I, I also think that the um I mean, representation, there's been a lot of talk around, within the bi community at least, around using bi colors, for example, using, I mean, the bi flag, uh, which obviously has specific colors that you can use to signify that something might be bi. Um, also in photo shoots, there's sort of bi lighting, there's a whole sort of subcategory where it's also sort of accidental bi lighting, <laughs> um, where bi is just, we sort of claim it. <laughs> Look, ah, there it is. Um, maybe this is a not at visibility. And so I think that there, there are ways to, I think, play with that as well and make it your own. Um, mm -hmm. Great, so in terms of narrative structures, moving over to Effie. Um, so Effie Theos is an East London-based producer and director who is interested in how we can use storytelling to bring together bi visibility, intersectionality, and youth culture. Uh, one of my favorite of her, her, I think you'd call it a short film, short? is Dark Matter, which is a sci-fi visual art documentary that illustrates, it also illustrates a scientific concept of dark matter, right? Through the unseen presence of blackness. I, you've done some really beautiful work, Effie, and uh, I'm really happy to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess the, the um, Jacob, that was incredible. I could listen to you for hours. Um, you raised some really important topics, which I think, you know, talking about narrative and how do we actually portray the um, bisexuality, there's, there's the same challenges, you know, so my, my area is really in more short form content, eventually long form, but for now, short form content. Um, and a lot of that sits in uh, commercials, short films, music videos, lots of branded content. Um, and if we're talking about by youth, I guess the best place to really start is sort of examining Gen Z because a lot of this content is for them. It's marketed at them. Um, they're the ones that engage with it. Uh, they, they hungrily eat it all up. Um, so I think in terms of Gen Z, they, they are really inspirational because they, you know, sexuality and gender is really on a sliding scale. Um, there's a real rebellion, you know, th there's no boxes. They don't really think about um, sexuality in, in these binaries that have been 
um, such a huge part of LGBTQ history. Um, and I think a lot of that is in part due to the content that they're consuming online, through uh, social media, through places like Instagram, TikTok. Um, it's also the content that they consume through marketing as well, because uh, you know, marketing through the years it used to be very in your face, and now it, it can be a lot more beautiful. It can take um, the form of more film style stuff, which they consume, um, and a lot of it is narrative based and it's trying to tell a story. Um, but so I think I think the the by youth is 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 the biggest part. It's the, makes up the biggest. Um, portion of the LGBTQ um, Gen Z uh, and and uh, yeah and I guess telling their story is, is really really important um, but I think there's a really specific way to, to do that and to create visibility for them um, and I think you, you have to talk to them on in a way that Gen Z are now communicating um, and, and, and the, the language that they're using uh, so, so I guess one of the challenges of that is really um, figuring out like how do we tell this by narrative? Um, and I know we were talking before um, before this all started about uh, you know short form content can be anywhere between thirty seconds, ten seconds, uh, and fifteen minutes, um, and those same challenges of, of telling by stories and making that explicit uh, is even more so with this sort of content that by youth are greedily eating up. Um, so a big part of that is I think that the, the, the problem is a lot of this stuff is not being, um, it's not being marketed to them because I guess, you know, it's all about creating by visibility. They're not really seen as being a big, um, a big space to market content to, so those stories don't generally cater to them. Um, and I think uh, the 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 other really important thing is that that um, within telling these these stories, we don't really have bisexual people in the room. Let's say so. Um, we we you know with this with short form content, we need to have more by directors. Um, we need to have more by writers, uh, and I think you know so much content is marketing. So a lot of brands are trying to cater to this new generation of spenders, um, and they're not really speaking to by people, and that's a, a huge, a huge portion of that. Um, so there's a lot of challenges, and, and I'm yet to figure out how to do that. But I think having these people in the room is so important. Um, just to having engaging and, and, and genuine stories. So, I think that's that's an absolutely great point. The sort of having the right people in the room, making sure that the community is represented in the writers' room and on the screen, and in terms of who's written, in terms of characters. Um, I think that your point about uh, marketing and what sort of more broadly often referred to as sort of the pink economy uh, and the pink pound, sort of this people who also maybe have more disposable income. That's often used to refer to actually gay men and their sometimes presumed, sometimes not real, but assumed sort of additional ability to spend um, because of sort of yeah, d different influences on how much money they're able to keep and also maybe not having kids, for example. Um, and so the sort of idea that there's more disposable income. And so, but even without that, even assuming that that's not the case, I think that you're right, that we know that from research that in terms of polls, more young people today are identifying as LGBT+, specifically the largest category that seems to be growing in terms of how people are labeling themselves as bisexual. And that is particularly true for people under the age of 25. And so um, we are seeing a cohort of people who are growing up with presumably uh, this label queer and this concept of queer and bi plus identities and fluidity being a much more um, possible identity label that is then also embraced and used. Um, my question for you is in terms of sort of creating bi visibility, have you seen any impetus or any desire from, let's say you get approached for adverts or for short form content in terms of, you know, tapping into this market. Um, ha have you ever been approached with someone saying, oh, we'd specifically like to either include or talk to or tailor this to bi plus individuals? No, never. 
and that that's really the problem because I think people look at they look at this like you said the pink economy is that we're either marketing to gay or lesbian uh and that's as far as it goes and often it's quite tokenistic as well um because a lot of that content will be made around um pride week and then it's kind of forgotten about for the rest of the year until pride week turns off again um so yeah so unfortunately i have never but in my own writing i make a point of including by stories um as much as possible and and you know Hopefully in the future, someone will approach me, but it's never happened. Okay, uh, I guess that's <laughs> a, a good in terms of, a good thing to end on with you in terms of hopefully you're also, I mean, you are also the future of producers and creators. So hopefully voices like yours will be amplified and uh, you'll be able to write those beautiful bi characters. And as Jacob's work was sort of showcasing also, it's easier to avoid cliches if you're part of the community, you're not just sort of gonna, you know, put people into a three-way relationship immediately to sort of be like, this is the only way we can showcase bisexuality is concurrent attraction and relationships with multiple genders, uh, which is also just a not a lot of people's um, lived experience. So, um, okay, uh, thank you so much, Effie. And um, next, um, touching on culture, and so this sort of idea of Gen Z and by youth, I think was really interesting that Effie was bringing up. Um, Helen, Dr. Helen Bas Catton, does research on bi spaces and community as well in a different way. So Dr. Helen Bas Catton is a critical social psychologist at the Open University and her research focuses on bisexual spaces. She's been researching bisexuality in the UK since 2004 and completed her PhD on bisexual people's experience of being bi at bi events and in everyday life. She's a lecturer, again, at the Open University and has written extensively about bipolar issues. She's got some beautiful articles out there. If you Google Scholar her, you'll find some great ones. Helen. So nice to you. Thank you. Oh, it's really interesting. Lovely to be here and really, really interesting to, to see how like these talks just segue perfectly into each other. Like we're all kind of thinking about the same issues, which is really interesting. Um, so yeah, um, my work is around, I think what Jacob and Effie have both set, uh, both established really clearly is that there's this real issue of bisexuality not being culturally kind of legible, right? And that you can't, and I think that time is a really important example of that. It really struck me listening to both of those talks that the central issue really is that you can't perform bisexuality in a, a way that's culturally legible in the present tense right you can talk about it in, in terms of your history your relationship history or where you'd like to go into the in the future but um short of actually yeah like having everyone in you know in a short film a short of everyone everyone visibly having partners of more than than one gender it's it's just really difficult to make it culturally legible um and to 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 make it make sense to people and that is what really lies behind, I think, why over the years there's been such a big drive from bi activists to find bi spaces and to set up spaces where you can kind of collapse the paradox of being bisexual for a little while and just be in a space where you are recognised for what you are and where your identity can be validated. So I went into looking at bi spaces to sort of see what what they did for people and what it was actually like when when you were there. <clears throat> and one of the most interesting things that I found was that actually for a lot of my participants, so I looked at an event called BiCon, which has been running for over thirty years now, um, annually in the UK. Um, and I looked at kind of people's talk, people's narratives in a, 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 of going to this event, being at the event, and then leaving the event, and, to, and and how they sort of transitioned into and out of the space. So what was really interesting was that once they got to the event, actually, they didn't really talk about being bi very much at all. It was like they almost didn't notice it. Like, once they got into a space where they could just, as one of my, as one of my participants said, they could just be bisexual. So they didn't kind of, there was a lot of stuff in their narratives about how they, they really experienced themselves as constantly kind of rubbing up against the world, you know, so they would talk about in their narrative about going to bike on, they would talk about, you know, I'm on this train and I feel really squashed in this seat. 
and that's kind of how I feel about being bisexual in my everyday life you know it's something that they're always kind of bumping into it's like they sort of chafe against the world because they don't quite fit it's like when you sit in a chair that's not quite big enough for you and you constantly feel it squishing your hips you know and it's this kind of constant felt reminder that you don't fit somewhere so then they talk about when they get to Bicon having this and they literally almost all the participants literally did this big kind of <sighs> where they did this breathing out and a lot of them talked about feeling that they could breathe out and be in this bisexual space and almost kind of almost kind of forget about being bi for a bit and just get on with being themselves um and so i think yeah there, there's something there's something there about like why these spaces have been so important to people is that they just want somewhere where they can be recognized and validated in the present tense you know not having to constantly like jacob said earlier kind of like oh i used to be uh this might have been in the, in the chat beforehand actually but jacob was saying something about you have to kind of in your coming out narrative you kind of have to repudiate you know oh i was married for 20 years but that was just a mistake you know um i was really this all along or what have you um and so it's i think it's just really valuable and important for people to be able to be recognized for who they are in um in in real time basically and that's what people get out of by spaces so for a lot of people they have this kind of carnival-esque kind of feel to them where it's almost like a retreat from the world where you can kind of go into the space put all the assumptions of the outside world down and be yourself for a bit although like massive caveat that works really well for a certain group of people and it doesn't work well for other people so it bicon in particular tends to work quite well for the sort of usual suspects of the lgbt community so it works quite well for middle class highly educated white people it doesn't work so well for people who because the problem is when you get a kind of retreat type space like that where you get everybody kind of coming together in outside of the world on a university campus in the middle of the summer for a weekend you get this kind of us against the world thing but in order to have that us against the world thing you have to have some sort of imagined other to define to define yourselves against and black and brown bisexuals and people um yeah people from working class backgrounds people who didn't go to uni can find themselves really at, like fish out of water in that environment and and positioned often in really tacit really subtle ways as the other you know the the ex, the imagined other of that space and it's really obvious when you're in that space and you are the imagined other, other of that space it might not be that anyone says anything but it's like being back in that squishy chair on the train you sure as heck can feel it yeah and i think that's one of the big challenges for, for buy spaces I think, uh, so I know that you, because I mean, you helped organize for many years um, by events and you have been deeply embedded within the bi community and see the importance of bi spaces, but you've also been a very outspoken critic of how um, exclusive these kinds of spaces can be. And you've been very concerned specifically about um, the exclusion of uh, people of color from, or <laughs> unintentional is I think mostly the, the term, but it's certainly, it's there, it's, it's obvious as well. And this is true for lots of LGBT plus spaces. This isn't just bi spaces but still it's totally. yeah you know it's, it is something that needs to be tackled and there have been correctly um public critiques of things uh, like bicon and um uh, th that's something that it continues to need to be a conversation in terms of how we can make these spaces actually accessible and not just a party for privileged people <laughs> um in terms of uh engaging in intersectionality I, I guess there's a question here as well around do you think we need bi spaces I think is a question that some people also have on their mind. Like, do we need this carnivalesque space just to be by? Well, I, I'm thinking about like what Effie was saying about like Gen Z and like kind of how, you know, this sense that, and I know that it's not as simple as that, but there is a sort of sense that um, the kids have got it sorted, you know, that the, the, the younger people don't uh, just don't think about gender and sexuality in the same way um, as maybe, you know, Gen X did. And so, Perhaps I'm I'm always hopeful that that you know certainly like listening to my my daughter and her friends it's just not a thing for them in the in the same in the same way they almost sort of take the idea that not everyone's 100% straight as a bit of a default assumption in some ways and I know that that's not going to be everywhere but part of me does wonder if um, 
young if people who are younger now will need those spaces in the same way that that people who've been going for 20 years really feel that they still need those spaces um partly because those spaces have produced a shift in culture right they've done the job that they needed to do and they've helped what they've done in a way is they've helped people to they form these little sort of bases for resources where people can network with each other and then go out into the world from there and queer their world really and that's what a lot of people talked about um in my research was that like i used this place yeah i had a party here but i also used it as a place where i could gather resources to then go and kind of queer my world so maybe if that's worked then those spaces are, are, are out living their their you know their, their usefulness but maybe not as well you know maybe it's it's maybe we're always going to need maybe well, there'll be less emphasis on those kinds of bi-centered spaces but i think we're always going to need those places i mean we always just as people need those spaces where you can go and just be read for who you are you know you can just talk to that one friend who really gets it you know and i think that people will always need that to an extent yeah fascinating i yeah i mean there's a couple of things here one is that um bicon was one of the first certainly anglo um by conferences by specific conferences and by events uh, it was one of the first in europe as well or possibly the first in europe and uh, it was really at the cusp of when bisexuals are sort of saying hmm actually i think like we maybe need our own space and that was possible partly because there were some real tensions within the lgbt community where bisexuality was complicating who the other was so the sort of who are we fighting if we're fighting for right. LGBT plus rights, for example, right? Who is the other? And bisexuals make that harder. You know, if you're both is the perception, right? Heterosexual and homosexual. Well, but are you more heterosexual or more? And this is where also the percentage thing comes in where people get really toxic about, yeah, but what percent <laughs> are you? Which is just not a useful way of talking about sexuality, I think. Um, but this sort of, again, gatekeeping of who is this space for and sort of you can't sit with us. And that was a real thing that was happening and that was perceived to be happening in the in the 80s and 90s. And so I think, I mean, for me, that's that's certainly what Bicon emerged out of. And so you're saying that maybe we don't need the space in the same way, I think is probably right. But having been to Buy Pride for the first time last year, I'd never been to a space like that. And it was fucking incredible. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I think there are a lot of people who still need these spaces. I don't think this question has gone away. And in some ways, actually, these intersectional conversations are probably the core ones to have. So in some ways, it's people who don't have maybe as much space in their own communities. Um, say if you're queer and, and Muslim, for example, or queer in any kind of religious, if you come from a community that's not as LGBT inclusive for whatever reason, um, you probably are more in need of these spaces than, than other people. And so that's why that conversation on intersectionality, I'm so glad, Ellen, you are uh, continuing to take the charge on that. Um, okay, and now moving on to Sam Lott. Speaking of uh, groups within groups <laughs> mm -hmm. and intersectionality and talking about all the beautiful and uh, different experiences, of course, bisexuality also here. I just want to say it, it seems obvious, but I want to say it. Um, bisexuality isn't monolithic. Everybody has their own experience and what that means to them. And uh, Sam is good at unpicking some of that. So Sam Lawton is a social researcher who studies sexuality and stigma of bi plus men specifically, and is currently engaged as a doctoral candidate in sociology at the University of Glasgow. Sam is also part of the Biosexual Research Group, um, as is Helen, as is Jacob. Um, and uh, together with Sam and Jacob, actually, I published a paper called The Futile Search for Physiological Evidence of Male Bisexuality in the Psychology of Sexuality's Review. This was a response of all the whole group to what was perceived to be a really toxic perspective, which is basically a group of researchers who were saying, prove it to male to men who are bi and the proving it was to use a penile plethysmograph to measure arousal in response to specific sexual stimuli and the, the publication came out and said proof that bisexual men exist and the fact that that happened in 2020 and that was published and was allowed to be published with that kind of language is incredibly toxic so sam Ta tell me about your work on bi plus men and why you're interested in bi plus men's rela relationships specifically and sort of what is it about bi men that you think needs its own space for discussion? Uh, thanks, Julia. So really, uh, I came to, well, my my journey towards like studying bisexuality kind of starts with my, I had a general interest in sexuality studies, um, but I didn't, I bisexuality wasn't kind of the first thing that I that I studied, I actually began studying um, asexuality 
Um, and, you know, I in interviewed a few asexual um, individuals for, uh, for my uh, undergraduate and postgraduate theses. Um, and yeah, I kind of had this kind of, um, I, I suppose I became uncomfortable because um, as asexuality was this kind of like very marginalized, you know, hadn't really emerged, um, uh, you know, in the cultural sphere, um, certainly isn't uh, not as much as bisexuality had. I, I kind of became uncomfortable being a kind of spokesperson for a community that I was not a part of. So I kind of decided to sort of turn um, turn my analytic gaze on myself, I suppose, and on uh, bisexual, uh, you know, on, on and on bisexuality in general, which um, by that point had been studied a little bit more than um, asexuality. So um, there's one of the reasons why I'm kind of interested in uh, bisexual men specifically is because um, I, I kind of read a lot, um, a lot of, uh, of like uh, feminist research around um, bisexuality and that overwhelmingly um, kind of looked at uh, bisexual women's experience and I was interested in um, you know in some you know in essentially what what the other side of that was um, and you know I was interested in bisexual men's experiences um, and you know there are there's kind of a lot of um, you, you know going back to the discussion that we were having about bisexual spaces um when i went and carried out my research it was really interesting to kind of talk to people who talked about interacting in in different kinds of spaces in kind of more you know uh heteronormative spaces um but also within lgbt spaces as you know feeling feeling kind of um you know marginalized within those spaces was what we call uh, double discrimination um, because bisexual bisexual people are kind of often face discrimination from uh, both kind of general heteronormative society but also uh, from uh, lesbian and gay communities as well they can do um, in certain contexts so yeah I was I was kind of interested in in people's um, you know experiences of, of of that of kind of um, feeling marginalized within those particular spaces for, for example I had one participant who was um, who was in the army at, at the time at a time where it was actually illegal to uh, to be uh, to to be openly uh, gay or uh, lesbian or bisexual for that matter um, and he described kind of coming out of the army and then sort of um, you know going to clubs you know going to gay clubs and things like that but experiencing a kind of a similar, well, a comparable level of hostility, you know, where he was told by people that, you know, bisexual men don't exist. Um, you know, they're actually just like, you know, closeted uh, gay men who are, you know, just confused and things like that and had to face all these kind of things. So I'm interested in, in you know, in, you know, people interacting with spaces, um, with LGBT spaces and how, how that you know how that how I'm interested in in what in what inclusivity really means I suppose because some people find that um, they you know they they go they have certain expectations um, you know of you know all of the alphabet soup being represented within spaces that I've had um, you know uh, trans participants tell me for example uh, you know I interviewed a, um, a a trans man who identified as bi um who talked about their experiences of being in um it being in a kind of inclusive rugby team and they uh they were surprised that you know they 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 kind of they couldn't talk about their um their kind of uh their different gender desire and attractions within that space and they felt that they would would have been kind of like cast out of the group had they talked about that so um that that was really really interesting and and you know they 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 said that you know some some people within within that group also kind of expressed some kind of you know had some kind of slightly transphobic language and things like that so yeah i'm i'm interested in um i suppose that's my journey towards uh studying bisexual men and why i think um uh you know studying bisexual i think i th i think also like studying um it's good to kind of not you know have this really like homogenizing um focus as well it's it's true that like bisexual people are um you know are uh, the biggest kind of mi minority within you know the lgbt 
um, community, but uh, it's good to kind of, um, you know, it's, I think it's good to study, you know, different gendered experiences as well. Um, and, you know, how, you know, how gender and sexuality interact as well. So. Absolutely. I also think that the um, that sort of gender sexuality, certainly in terms of stereotypes as well, certainly in terms of assumptions and whether you're able to fit. Um, I mean, there's toxic views in both or multiple directions. Certainly when we're talking about by woman, for example, often the assumption is that bi is fine because, frankly, the male gaze and you're still available to heterosexual men is my assumption. It's always how I read that, where it's like, oh, because it's performative. And there's this whole, as Jacob um, actually mentioned earlier, there's sort of a link with porn there as well, that it's so expected almost in porn settings. And that's mm -hmm. often also, I think, for some people at least, the only experience they have with seeing um, women who are sexually engaging with men and women um, or multiple genders. I think that within that, there is there is that male gaze that comes out really heavy and it's very much sort of, it's seen as performative and it's like, well, but it's not such a big deal because it just means that there's more fun to be had. Whereas with by men, I think there's often more of an almost perceived threat or a, oh, but it means that you must be secretly gay. Um, in mm. some ways, I think actually with women, it's, you, you're probably secretly heterosexual and you're yeah. performing. With men, I think it's the assumption that you're secretly gay and you're not, you haven't fully come to terms with that. And this isn't to say that, I mean, sex, bisexuality can be a phase. I think it's, it, there's a bit of a problem with the narrative that we sometimes share, which is that bisexuality isn't a phase. It is for some, and I think that is okay as well, that if that's part of your journey to whatever your sexuality is, I think we should be willing as human beings to change our labels over time, just like we do with lots of other things. So that's another piece of it. But I guess in terms of everyday bisexual representation, so I guess the last sort of question around bi plus men, what do you think we can do to, what do you think people need to know about bi plus men in relationships? Well, um, I, I think it's interesting to kind of think about representation. And I think so much, there's so much um, within stereotypes about bisexual men that they're unfaithful partners, that they're confused, that they're in this kind of transitory um, phase, uh, you know, that they're that they're promiscuous, that they're like hypersexual, you know, they, they sleep with lots of people. Um, I think there's kind of like two approaches we can take to that is, is kind of unpacking, you know, what is like um, about the kind of, you know, uh, unpacking what is necessarily like negative about those things. And um, obviously like being being an unfaithful partner is, you know, is, is a negative thing, but really like um, being like being promiscuous, that's a pretty conservative like standard to hold people to. So I think we really need to kind of, um, uh, I, I, I think, and this was, this was another thing that kind of came through in, um in my discussions with with uh, with other bi people was that they were afraid to to in any way um conform to any of these stereotypes and it's really it's it you know and it's it's a shame because you know i had you know i had, I had people who were in um you know who were in non-monogamous relationships who were reluctant to disclose that to people because they felt that it would you know that because they felt that it would um, kind of prove some of those like, you know, quote unquote negative stereotypes about bisexuality uh, correct. But really, you know, it, what what do we need to do to kind of debunk stereotypes? It's, um, it's you know, it's saying that, um, you know, some of these things are like, it's actually just fine to, you know, it's it's fine to have more than one partner. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to, to, you know, have sex with people, you know, with, to have sex with lots of people, you know, there's nothing, you know, nothing necessarily wrong with it. It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's the 21st century. I mean, um, so I think that's, that's kind of one strategy that we can do is kind of, um, you know, unpick those kind of things, but also when we're talking about, uh, representation and particularly media representations of bisexuality, I think there's always this concern that, you know, um, that, you know, bisexual characters are going to kind of conform to these stereotypes as well. So I think we, we really need to think about, you know, rather than rather than thinking about what bi characters don't do, what bi characters can do, you know, how can they, you know, be positive, you know, bisexual men, how can they be kind of positive portrayals of masculinity, you know, I think I think there is something to to bisexuality, which is you know I I think there's um, something to um, bisexual men, which is you know does does make people uh, you know a bit more empathetic. I think 
Um, I think there's a lot, you know, a lot of the 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 bi men, well, pretty pretty much all the bi men who I spoke to were self were self identified feminists, you know. Uh, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot there where we can kind of push for um, not just representations which which are, are not bad, as in they they avoid these kind of negative stereotypes, but what are some of the like positive things, you know? Um, you know, what are some of the kind of like real positive a- attributes behind bisexuality, you know? And, yeah. and I think, you know, empathy is is a, a, just a, a really good point with that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the, uh, so I guess to wrap it up uh, in the last couple of minutes of this talk and t- picking up on something that Sam was saying, um, I think that sort of that positive representation and sort of fighting stereotypes is obviously a key thing that's come up throughout these discussions. Um, how to make spaces more inclusive has become, has been central to this discussion. Um, there's also a part of me that sort of recontextualizing this within a historical context. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from a <laughs> patient of Fritz Klein. So Fritz Klein wrote The Bisexual Option, which was one of the first, um, well, one, an early academic book on bisexuality. Um, now this was after the Kinsey reports, which a lot of people have heard about, which happened in the sort of late 40s, early 50s. And there it was sort of established that actually quite a lot of people People are probably not entirely homosexual or heterosexual. Um, and there's a lot of more people who might be fluid or land somewhere else uh, in terms of their sexuality, which was quite disruptive to conceptualization of sexuality at the time. But um, in the, I think it was the 70s, Fritz Klein published his book and um, has also done work since then. Now, in this book, one of his patients is cited, actually the parents of one of his patients is cited as to why they're so concerned that their daughter might be bisexual. And he says, well, you know, a man here, a woman there, too much freedom. And I, I've always thought this was a really funny argument of, oh, it's just it's just too much. No, no one person should have this much freedom. And I do think that in this panel, we've also been focusing mostly on visibility. We've been focusing on context and space. Of course, there's an entire literature on the negative consequences of sort of stigmatization of biphobia. There's a whole literature on mental health, for example. And so if you're interested in these kinds of things, there's some great research out there as well. Um, my own research I'm uh, looking forward to also learning more about myths that people endorse around bisexuality and that also often um, people reject it as a label they want to use for themselves. And I think one of the things that we can continue to, to have discussions about is how we can make it more visible and more of an option to call yourself bisexual and to see it as sort of not a dirty word. And I think that sometimes both within the queer community and within heteronormative communities, bisexuality is it's practice, it's everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of bisexual behavior amongst people who label themselves in very different ways. But I just think that it would be nice if more people felt able to use the term by and to say, hey, actually maybe, maybe I'm not heterosexual and that's okay too. And because of that, to then also have more access to resources, more access to community and to overall probably have better health outcomes. Um, so that's my goal is to sort of try and figure out uh, how we can also Make, make lemonade basically out of some of the negatives that we've been talking about. Um, I think I probably speak for the group in saying that being bi is pretty great. Um, there's obviously negative aspects, there's obviously um, downsides to it, but overall it's um, a wonderful thing that we, should also, that we can celebrate. And so in terms of visibility as well, it took me many years to, be, to come out as bi and I'm very happy I did. And I would encourage people if they feel safe and able to do so, to do that as well. Um, finishing up, uh, in terms of following people, where I'm going to do a quick fire round. Um, you can find me at Dr. Julia Shaw on all the socials. Um, Helen, where can we find you? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Always, right? Mostly I'm on Twitter at hbosecatton without the hyphen, uh, just all one word lowercase. Um, so, yeah, that's mostly where you can find me. And I've got a web page at HelenBoscatter.com. Fantastic. Effie, where can we find you? Uh, Instagram is probably easiest. It's just Effie Rose Theos. Great. Sam? Uh, I'm at By Men Research on Twitter. And Jacob? And Twitter would be best for me as well. I am at Critical P R V R S N. That's Critical Perversion without the little letters in between <laughs> great um and uh it's a shame we didn't have time to open it up for questions but if you do 
you can tweet any of us, presumably, with questions that are direct to that individual. You can also check out the Bisexual Research Group, which is bisexualresearch.com or at Bisexual Science uh, on Twitter. Um, so, so great to have all of you here, and I'm going to hand it back to Justin. Thanks, Julia. And thanks for such a, uh, what an enlightening panel. What a really exciting panel. Thank you to everyone that was involved. Um, I learned a lot. As a historian, it was fantastic to hear so much from people across other disciplines and working in other areas. And I think judging by all the comments that I saw going by in, in the meantime and seeing some of the activity on social media, if anything, there is profound disappointment that this isn't going on another hour, another hour after that. But I think that really just goes to show that there's a lot of interest in this and it's a really good sign that we really should come together and do more. Um, I also want to uh, to finally thank the, uh, the the staff LGBTQ network at Goldsmiths and the Metro Charity for being involved in this uh, in this collaboration. It's really a delight from the perspective of the Center for Queer History to have been part of that as well. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to plug our next event um, on the twenty third of March. Um, we're going to be holding the fourth annual Goldsmiths Queer History Lecture. Um, this year it's going to be delivered by Dr. Benno Gamerl, who was uh, formerly of Goldsmiths and was uh, part of the Center for Queer History, but is now at the European University Institute in Florence. And Benno will be speaking on uh, uh, giving a paper called Good Times and Also Very Bad Ones, Queer History in Modern Germany. So that covers a lot of territory and I hope we'll see you there. Thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight. Goodbye.